Hi. Hello. We're starting chapter 13 of In Search of Christian Freedom. The chapter is t entitled Argumentation and Manipulation. It begins with the text from 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2 from Philip's Modern English Translation. We have set our faces against all shameful secret practices. We use no clever tricks, no dishonest manipulations of the Word of God. We speak the plain truth and so commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Ray starts, even in view of all the evidence presented, I feel it would be a mistake to think that every one of Jehovah's Witnesses believes what he or she believes and does what he or she does entirely out of a conscious or subconscious sense of intimidation by authority. It would also be a mistake to think that all witnesses seek to conform to the organization's program, programs of meetings and activity and to its standards of conduct and rules solely out of a concern over peer pressure or threat of sanctions. That may be true of many, but not all. Actually, any conscious sense of intimidation is often first realized when one begins to raise questions. Men in authority do not feel threatened by people who comply, but may feel so toward those who begin asking for reasons why. So, while intellectual intimidation is, is clearly a strong factor, it is not necessarily the controlling factor with each individual. I am satisfied that there are numerous men and women who are where they are simply because they believe it is the truth. I believe that was the overriding factor in my spending all of my adult life as a full-time representative of the witness organization. I did what I did and did it wholeheartedly because I believed I had the truth, God's truth, and I'm sure the same can be said for many others. Since there are certainly many clear-thinking, intelligent persons within the organization, how is it that more questions are not raised? Undoubtedly, here the intimidation factor does have some effect and there is definitely a climate of fear existing today as to expressing doubts. But even if these are not expressed vocally, why do not more persons ask questions within themselves, in their own hearts and minds? In view of the evidence available, it seems hard to believe that persons can so readily accept as revealed truth the teachings of an organization with such a checkered record of reliability. While it is true that as witnesses we are trained to dis discipline ourselves to accept without doubting, I think that this alone could not have sufficed for us to go along year by year in a course of almost total acceptance. I do not consider myself a particularly gullible person, although my parents were of this faith. It was not a case of my following dutifully in their path. In reality, on reaching the teenage years, I came to the point where I had stopped attending meetings completely. Then, in 1938, when I was 16, my father spoke to me very seriously about my lack of spirituality, my irreligious course, and asked me why I thought Jehovah would spare me at Armageddon when I was doing less than our church-going neighbors. While I recognize that the thought of facing possible destruction by God for not being fully in the truth had some motivating effect, I know that this likewise was not the sole or major motivation. I was probably more shaken by the fact that my own father viewed me as perhaps unworthy of God's favor in life than by the thought of any impending future destruction. Simply put, after renewing my attendance at meetings, I became convinced that what I was learning through the publications was the truth. Admittedly, the association with the congregation filled somewhat of a vacuum that had existed in my life, and the activity I began to engage in gave a sense of direction to my life. These things, without question, exerted an influence. Yet the fact is that I did believe it. The way in which the material was presented, the argumentation used, caused me to believe I was learning the truth. Today I ask myself, how, why, that the argumentation was and is seriously flawed is clear to me. I do not feel any sense of credit for now discerning that. The evidence was there all along. So there is certainly no cause for pride when considering that it took me nearly 40 years of my life 
to come to the realization of the error. The effect is decidedly more one of humiliation than exaltation. Others saw many of these flaws considerably before I did, simply through their study of Scripture. And here he has a footnote to referencing Percy Harding, who we talked about in a recent video, the man who was disfellowshipped at 91, when he went through his publications, which he inherited, apparently, or made his own, he noticed that Percy Harding had annotated a lot of his publications for years mm -hmm. with questions and doubts that he already had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ray goes on, they did not have the benefit of nine years experience in the inner council of the organization as I did. How then was I so convinced for so long? And how are millions of others, many of them clearly sensible, intelligent persons, similarly convinced? Unless we are considerably more credulous than I think is the case, it seems evident that the argumentation employed is the product of considerable ability, an ability to present views in a quite plausible, seemingly rational way. Coupled with that, and perhaps the key to the whole matter, has been the desire to believe, wanting to believe. It is normal for people to wish for certainty and a sense of security that certainty brings. The Watchtower organization offers that. For whatever it says, it presents as the right explanation of God's word, the only true explanation, with no equivocation. It is normal for people to wish that there were some source that could answer all their questions about God, his purposes, about life and human destiny. The organization offers to do that too, and to do it with confidence. It is normal to wish to know specifically what one should do to gain God's approval, and how and when to do what he wants. The organization offers a very clearly outlined program of activity with very definite rules of conduct and the assurance that anyone holding loyally and submissively to these will be spiritually strong, joyful, and win God's blessing. It does all this in a way that conveys a sense of intellectual appeal as opposed to emotionalism the emotionalism that is found in many churches and religious revivals. To believe that you are in the truth, that you are part of the one organization on earth that God is dealing with, a people of divine destiny, the only people on earth who really understand the Bible, brings for many the sense of security they seek. That was the feeling I had, and it caused me to give myself without hesitancy to whole soul service under the direction of the witness leadership. I was an active part of a growing organization, and I equated the organization's expansion with the spread of truth, life-giving truth. To work for the organization's expansion was to share in the battle against error, with the conquering power of truth bringing liberation to those held captive by religious falsehood. It is a shaking experience to realize that this is not actually the case after so long a time when you find yourself facing the seventh decade of your life. Yet others have realized it even later in life. In March 1982, after the appearance of an article in Time magazine, a letter from a witness came addressed to Peter Gregerson, on whose property I was then living. It included these comments, quote, I am writing to you hoping it will come to the attention of Brother Raymond Franz. I was deeply moved after reading the article in the Time and his letter of appreciation le later, which moved me to think that we had something in common. I was baptized in 1917 and was at Cedar Point in 1919 and 1922, and after this was preaching Millions now living will never die, all around Ohio. I am conscious of the fact that we all had a sort of built-in fear through the years that we should not question the Watchtower. Lately, it has come to pass that it's impossible to consider Scripture in the Watchtower study and express an opinion without feeling you might be thrown out of the synagogue as an apostate. 
That's the end of the, the, quote. the yeah. quote. The person writing, John Knight, was 93 years old. His association with the Watchtower organization covered a span of over 75 years. As he wrote later, when seeing inconsistencies, his initial reaction was to blame himself, asking himself if he were not just a fault finder. He was disturbed by one of the same things that disturbed me, the dogmatism found in the Society's publications. He wrote, quote, Like the Bereans, I felt we should search the scriptures to see if the things taught us are so. This has troubled me to no end, as through the years the position of the Watchtower has been a total position. I hate to use the word infallible, but that is the view that many of the friends have, and indeed that is the position I found myself in obliged to obey the society's mandate. Now came the hard part, when I could not find any scriptures to support certain positions taken by the Watchtower." End of quote. John Knight's comments were typical of many received from persons in various countries, England, Sweden, Belgium, Germany, Spain, Brazil, Nigeria, New Zealand, and other lands. Many of those writing have a background of 20, 30, 40, or more years as witnesses. Remarkably, most of them had arrived at similar conclusions, privately, with no knowledge that others felt as they did. Since truth is inseparably linked with freedom, it seems crucial that we make it our determination to analyze what we are told, what we hear, read, and hear, and weigh carefully the factualness of the things stated and the validity of the argumentation used. Otherwise, we may free ourselves of certain chains of error only to allow new chains of error to be fastened upon us. Recognizing particular methods of deceptive argumentation can help us in protecting our freedom of mind, heart, and conscience. He has a footnote that alludes to the fact that he and his wife kept up contact with John Knight for several more years. John Knight died at the age of 96 and requested that Ray conduct his funeral. Yeah. So that's a touching end to a mm -hmm. life, 75 years. I, I related very much to this, yeah. this reasoning here because I did believe it was true. You know, I, I had that confidence and and I guess I wanted to believe it was true. Yeah, the wish. And we heard that from some who when we were leaving we tried to present some of the information. They said, No, I I want this to be true. You know, yeah. So there's fear and, and people n need to feel a sense of security. And and they think if they lose the watchtower they're gonna lose that sense of security. And you mm -hmm. will for a time. But that doesn't mean you have to stay in that position forever. We're going to put a link on your screen to your witness about that, right? Well, mm -hmm. I think it was titled "Why In, yeah. Why, Why Out." Yeah. So, so there's the, the it's first a testimony. part of a series, yeah. And it'll be linked to subsequent follow-up videos. Mm -hmm. "Why In, Why Out" by Vivian, and next time, the subhead is recognizing common pitfalls of false argumentation. Mm -hmm.